Hello and welcome to the Bechdel Theatre Podcast, the podcast where we talk about gender and representation on stage. I'm Pippa and for this intro, I'm your host. That's right, today I don't have my co-host Beth with me, but don't worry, we were together for the interview and if you stick around to the end, you'll get your usual roundup of shows by Beth, uh, of shows we recommend to see in the next month. So this episode, we spoke to Mediha Ansari, who was the engagement manager on the play Trojan Horse. Now, Trojan Horse is a play that we saw in 2018 at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, and it has been on tour, and it's now landed at Battersea Arts Centre, and um, explores the Trojan Horse inquiry of 2014 and the effects it had on the community in Birmingham. And it was so great to talk to someone who was involved in the show, but wasn't involved in the creation or like the writing or performance, but was specifically involved in the show as the engagement manager and Mediha tells us all about her experiences of engaging uh, South Asian communities in the play and particularly South Asian women in the arts in general and it sounds like it was a really really important role especially for this particular production and the things that they did including panels and Urdu translations so um, she was an all-round amazing person to talk to. But before I hand over to past Beth and Pippa in this interview, and Mediha as well, I want to quickly let you know about our upcoming Bechdel event. We have a post-show discussion for the debut play by Eleanor Tyndall and directed by Anisha Srinivasan, Before I Was a Bear, which is on at the Bunker Theatre until the 23rd of November. We love the bunker! Um, So come see the show with us. We will be going to watch the show on Thursday the 21st of November, so put that in your diaries, and we'll be sticking around afterwards to chat about the themes of the show, what came up for us as audience members. Uh, There'll be, you know how these run, they're informal discussions where we chat about our responses and the creative team are welcome and are invited as well, and it's free with your ticket. Not only that, but as usual with our post shows, we've got a Bechdel discount code. So if you book your ticket to that night, you can use the code Bechdel10, that's 10, the digits 10, and you can get a £10 ticket, whereas I think standard tickets are £16. So come see the show with us, stick around afterwards for a chat. Um, We love doing our post show discussions and we actually saw the show and it was fucking amazing and hilarious and I'm so, so glad to be celebrating it. It follows the story of Callie, who is played by Jacoba Williams. We love Jacoba. Uh, A woman who, at the beginning of the play, is a bear. She's stuck in the body of a bear. Um, And if you think that might sound familiar, it's it's loosely inspired by Greek mythology. But it was so relatable and amazing to see it kind of transformed into a kind of modern day storyline. And it follows her relationship her relationship with herself, with partners, her sexuality and queerness and also themes of like victimhood and slut shaming and it was so so brilliant, brilliantly written, brilliantly directed, brilliantly performed. So come see it with us again on Thursday the 21st of November and we, obviously you can use that discount code as well. So we will see you there. Now I'm going to hand over to our interview and I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Hello everyone. Hello. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, we are here in a lovely um, kind of attic room at Battersea Art Centre, joined by Mediha and Zari to talk about the um, play Trojan Horse. Mediha, would you like to introduce yourself? To our yeah. Listeners? Hi guys. Thank you very much, uh, ladies. So my name is Mediha Ansari, and I like to go by the pronoun she. And I am the current engagement manager for Lung Theatre's Trojan Horse. Um, and we're on our first national tour. I'm the founder of the Cultural Ecology Project, uh, which is a project that we've set up to showcase, support, and create mentorship pathways for uh, South Asian women in the arts. Perfect. Amazing. (laughs) So for our listeners, we thought we might give a bit of a brief background as to the Trojan Horse case and also um, the play itself. Um, So hopefully we can give you a bit of an idea if you maybe don't remember it. Um, So the Trojan Horse case uh, centred around a letter that Birmingham City Council received claiming that there was um, co-conspiracy between um, 
some Islamist people to strategize um, taking over schools in East Birmingham and implementing extremist values um, into the school and for the students. Um, and that letter was called um, Trojan Horse. And um, what was initially quite a local uh, issue that happened got <laughs> fell into the hands of the press um, and blew up and became a national kind of outrage with lots of um, Islamophobia implemented by the press and the government and the kind of investigations that ensued. Um, and so Trojan Horse, the play, started off in 2018 and is made up of um, it well was created from over 200 hours of interviews with the people directly involved in the Trojan Horse case, including governors, students, teachers, people in the community, and is seeking to kind of give the voices that we actually really didn't hear when it kind of became a huge national story. Um, and it went on to win the Amnesty Freedom of Expression Award and the Fringe First Award, and that's where Beth and I first saw it in 2018. Um, at the Edinburgh Fringe, and it's now touring. So, Mediha, you are the, as you say, the engagement manager on this show. How did that role come about, and when did you kind of join the company? Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> I'm quite new, new to Trojan Horse, and I feel like I've met so many people who've watched it last year. Um, I got in, well, I was um, sort of recommended for this role through another arts organisation up in West Yorkshire called the Lawrence Batley Theatre. And they put, uh, put uh, Matt Woodhead, who is the co-writer and the director of the play, uh, in touch with me. And um, I found out about this, this role and I'd been doing quite a lot of community producing um, and community engagement work in my local area. And this just seemed really interesting. But I'll be honest with you, I don't think I knew as much as as much as ab about the themes of the project as as I do now, and at the time it was a job, and um, I applied for it, and I was re so this was about August time, and um, I was really pleased to know that I was offered the role. It was quite daunting because it was my first national tour as well. As well, I think a lot of the uh, people on the team it's their first national tour, and uh, we pretty much started the engagement work in September, right at the beginning of September. And uh, we went on tour four weeks later. <laughs> we started the tour in Leeds at the Leeds Playhouse, the new Leeds Playhouse. We actually opened it. Uh, we were the first show to open the new Leeds Playhouse building. And um, you know the show was written in association with the, um, what used to be known as the West Yorkshire Playhouse. Yeah, I was going to say, it was formerly known as the West Yorkshire yes. Playhouse and had an established reputation yes. and they went through this yeah. change and Trojan Horse was the... Yeah, yeah, Taking so production. like engagement work, if you don't know much about it, but it is a lot to do with trial and error because um, uh, the South Asian community in particular is still quite apprehensive about the arts and, um, and particularly this topic because there is still a lot of fear uh, because um, such a negative narrative was created by the media. I know, I know people personally who are kind of like, who, who are just, who like to take that, oh, we just want to stay out of it because something might be misconstrued, the media might miss quarters. And, um, but I think um, me being on the team, um, I think because there's a trust with a lot of the communities that we've approached for the engagement activities, um, I still have to go in and speak to people and I have to say to them, look, the play is on the right side of the story. It's, the right, it's on the right side of the truth. You can trust Matt and Helen. I almost have to advocate for the genuinity um, and the validity of the play because you know people are still quite scared. You might not know, but the whole play has been translated into Urdu completely, and uh, myself and another actor uh, recorded it. Um, so very late in September, uh, we record recorded the whole play here in London, and the um, Urdu-speaking audiences can access it via um, wireless headsets during the play. So it's a simultaneous translation. It's a great piece of um, technology, I think. Um, and it's a, that's available in every single show. And um, so uh, there, were t there was two parts to the engagement activity. One was uh, to try and engage schools and uh, community groups. And we are offering a free workshop with these groups. Um, and that, you know, is hard to come by. Nobody offers free workshops. And the workshop is designed um, around critical thinking, fact versus opinions, um, and then just encouraging people to take um, civil action against things that they might, you know, like injustices that they might 
um, they might think are occurring in society and uh, just sort of telling people and you know telling them that they have the permission to raise their voices and they've got the power and uh, they can hold people in authority accountable because a lot of people don't know that they can uh, you know a lot of people don't know that they can approach their MPs or their councillors and ask these um, questions um, and um, so yeah so we, we've done that within schools local schools and local community groups and then the second part of the engagement activity is that um, we have a really really great ticket offer so um, at every single show we've got about 25 free tickets for South Asian members um, those that would access the Urdu translation and then a really really good schools offer um, I think it was something like five pounds per ticket at most of the venues um, and and then obviously there was the free workshop so uh, I think Lung Theatre have taken a great initiative in investing in the engagement program I like to believe that I think 50% of this national tour was the engagement activity uh, but then there's a post show panel discussion after every single show, uh, which is really, really exciting. I chair those panels and um, that we've invited um, members of the community, local communities, um, experts in different fields. So we've had, you know, everyone from politicians to teachers to uh, um, people from MEND, which is a Muslim educational I'm gonna get this wrong um, mend um, it has real mend is a, a Muslim organization and they have really really supported um, the the national tour so we've had representatives from there and yeah so I mean last night we had Loki Loki you know Loki yeah. right Love Loki. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I have learned yeah so mend is uh, the Muslim engagement and development uh, team um, and they're working to create a positive social narrative for the Muslim, the British Muslim community. And uh, we've had a lot of representation from there. Um, Professor John Holmwood, who was one of the key witnesses um, for the defence in the original inquiries, has acted as their academic advisor for the play. He's touring with us. He's on every single panel. We had Sahema Manzoor Khan earlier this week. You know the brown hijabi, yeah. um, and just just people who you know who can contribute. Uh, we had Peter Auburn, uh, who you know a celebrated British journalist. He was on, um, and I think it's just really really great to hear from these people. And um, so yeah, the the panel discussions are really exciting. And you know we I think we've made uh, we've tried to up our social media game. I think the idea is just to get the truth out uh, out there. And yeah, we've had a really, really great response. We've almost sold out at every single venue, guys. Amazing. And yeah, yeah. So it's, it feels like, you know, obviously there's a really strong drive in getting this message out and reaching lots of different audiences because, I mean, there's such a emphasis on this tour and reaching South Asian community mm -hmm. audiences who may have been affected by the issues in it. When we saw it, it was, like, not that audience. Mm. It was, like, all of the people who've read about the Trojan horse case in the press mm. might have heard about it getting a different side yeah. to things and getting yeah. a kind of insight into what was really happening yeah. so it's really important for like the truth to reach everybody yeah yeah um how do you think the play manages that in terms of balancing like um rep people who are looking for representation of their <coughs> experiences perhaps their you know negative experiences and and elements of trauma involved in that in yeah attacks of the press and and experiences of people who've only read about it through yeah the, the media scapegoating and yeah, yeah of course right so um the national tour has been quite uh, i mean we've traveled pretty much the length and breadth of uh, England, pretty much. We've been to Wales. This national show, we haven't been to Scotland, but our next national show, which kicks off in February, guys, uh, we are starting in Glasgow, um, and we'll be going to Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, so um, we, every single, um, in every single city, the audience has been completely different. So we've gone from Leeds to Salford, the Lowry. We've been to Newcastle, which was a very different crowd to the crowd that we had in Bradford. We've been to Liverpool, which was a very predominantly white um, uh, crowd, but then we've been to Huddersfield and Halifax, which, you know, a bit more of a mixed crowd. In London, we've had a bit of a mixed crowd, but um, again, in London, because of the uh, location of the Battersea Arts Centre, which, by the way, is the most amazing venue, right? Um, but it's quite far away from, you know, accessibility in terms of um, sort of South Asian communities. It's still, it's still quite difficult, but I think <clears throat> the fact that the tour has been so geographically well-placed We've had, so we've been to Mould uh, at the Theatre Cloyd as well, um, just to mention a few of the venues. Mm. We, we've gone to fifth. We're going to go 
to 15 venues across 15 cities. Um, so I think we've had a wide range of, um, you know, like diversity um, in our audiences. I just want to tell you about something that happened in Newcastle, right? So uh, Newcastle, we did get a lot of the, we, we did get a select group of South Asian uh, community members that came to watch the show and that, you know, that was uh, directly because of the engagement activity that we'd done. But it was predominantly white and might I say middle class um, uh, audience. Um, and <clears throat> uh, on the second show, I think, um, a quite an elderly uh, woman came up to me and Matt, uh, Matt Woodhead, like I said, he's our co-writer and director, and she held both of our hands and she had tears in her eyes. This is after the play. And she said, thank you. I feel so ashamed. That's all she said to us. And she said, do not stop doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's all she said, and she just turned away and walked away. And I feel like there, there was, there's a great sort of lesson to be learned there because this is possibly a woman who had a certain idea about what she'd read about the Trojan Horse Inquiries or possibly the British Muslim community or, you know, communities from ethnic minorities. And through watching this play, play um, her, she may have been convinced otherwise. And it was really nice that she was able to accept that she felt ashamed. And But that's moving forward, right? That means that the truth has been accepted as the truth. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're trying to hit all our sort of avenues when it comes to marketing. And um, the show has been covered by Geo in Manchester and in Bradford. Geo is Pakistan's, um, or might I say, it's the, it's the largest... Um, Urdu speaking news channel, reporting channel uh, from Pakistan, and um, it's been so a report has been created. So and it's quite widely watched. Uh, so even people who may not have come to watch the show, they're definitely going to see. It. It's like BBC News or you know Sky News, which everybody watches. Um, and yeah, we've you know we've been on so many uh, several uh, radio shows. We're doing this with you guys. So yeah, we're just trying to get as far as we can. And straight after this tour finishes. We're going straight back into um, engagement work again for next tour. And you know we're going to the Houses of Parliament in January. Are you? Yeah. yeah. What are you doing in the Houses of Parliament? We're doing the play. Doing the play. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. In the houses. Yeah, we've been supported by Sayyidah, Baroness Sayyidah Varsi oh. and Nasha, MP uh, from Bradford. And uh, they're hosting us. Um, uh, and Sayyidah Varsi has also written the foreword for the play text. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're doing that. And there's a petition uh, that's um, a com a accompanying the, the national tour. And it's a petition, uh, it's a call out to government to define Islamophobia. Uh, because I think sometimes, uh, like, just plain old racism is wrapped up, wrap, you know, sort of like uh, camouflaged. Um, not camouflaged, it's like, you know, wrapped in this new rapper called Islamophobia, but Islamophobia is often just racism, guys, mm -hmm. right? And um, so, you know, there is the, there is a, a great, there's this whole movement where we're trying to hold the government accountable, hold those reporters that created those narratives back then accountable. And, um, you know, because I don't think justice can ever be served because the people who've, you know, so the teachers and governors who were directly involved or the community in at large, the parents, the the, te the students who went to that school, they've lost that time. Mm. They can never get that time back. But I think if people who are, are responsible for it can at least accept, you know, that what what happened was gravely, it was, a, is an, it was an act of grave injustice, it might bring a little bit, it might just bring a tiny bit, bit of justice. Um, yeah, I, I think it does an important thing in terms of representation in that it both specifically tells this story and redresses the press that was around that and kind mm. of tells the truth mm. about these, the people, the yeah. real people who this has affected. But it also does a great thing in terms of um, the representations and the way it centres um, a lot of the uh, characters who are often misconstrued by mm. audiences who aren't part of the community like um, the young women mm. and uh, the LGBT element in the story mm -hmm. if it's not too much of a spoiler mm -hmm. um, <laughs> is like um, th th there was a lot around at the time around um, the press and the government mm. using things like oh the way they treat women and oh the um, uh, they're not 
allowing LGBT um, education to happen. And actually the play kind of offers you a much bigger picture mm. on the different young women yeah. and, and different types of young women, their different beliefs, their different like attitudes and relationships with each other and them as like complex interesting characters yeah. and then like and then also the the lgbt element of the like um the character coming out and the sort of like it's not like immediately like oh my god you're going to hell kind of thing and it it sort of addresses those issues which must be affecting way more people than just the people who were yeah in yeah. the room at that time you know by representing their experience i think i think um it uh, like, I have to mention here that this is not my personal experience, but then I'm quite aware that I may come from quite a protected and uh, privileged uh, background, right? Uh, but look, sometimes, not sometimes, very many times, the British Muslim community is demonized, right? But look, a British Muslim 15-year-old teenager is just a 15-year-old teenager, right? A British Muslim parent is just a parent living in Britain. A British Muslim teacher is just a teacher. You know, they're, like, they're, they're not different. And I think the play really highlights that, um, you know, the, the issues that they're going through is exactly the same as any other 15-year-old or any other teacher in, in the community. It's that whole idea of otherism, you know, that, that create the sort of the creating of barriers. And I think, I think, I think the... The press, uh, I think they're, you know, they're guilty. Um, unfortunately, they're very, very guilty. And um, like I said, you know, they should be held accountable. They've done, they have done something incredibly wrong because um, the layman. I see. I don't blame. I don't blame the common people who hold negative, negative sort of narratives in their head because that's what they've been fed by the press. You know, but just constantly. It's a sort of brainwashing, right? I don't think common people living in Britain are bad people. I don't think hatred exists intrinsically within us. I think, I think our government and you know the higher forces above. I think they 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 fabricate it, and it's unfair because actually on the ground at grassroots level. All we're trying to do is just get on. You know, we're just trying to get on our days. Mums are just trying to bring up their kids, teachers. You know, we're all just trying to get through our day. People are running for the bus. People are trying to, you know, we're all stuck in traffic at the same time. We're all queuing up. at the So, it, and, and also, I just want to mention that Matt and Helen have said this to me. And what they said was we were really conscious about not making the Muslim characters look holier than holy. Um, so, you know, you've seen the play. So they do address the issue of, you know, the WhatsApp group. They do address sort of the negative, um, you know, like complexities that we have mm. within characters. So they haven't, they haven't gone and made the Muslim characters look quite perfect mm. because no one's perfect. They're just human beings, and I think we just need to realize that 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 thing. And you know, like sexism is not a Muslim problem. Sexism is a world problem. The LGBT, uh, like issues around LGBT, is not a Muslim problem. It is a problem everywhere, right? Um, young kids having problem coming out in front of their families. It's not just Muslim kids who have trouble. All kids have, like, I think generally it's quite a global phenomenon, right? Yeah, so. and something that really struck me about in the play is kind of going back to what you said about, you know, people are just trying to do the jobs and just trying to go to school and that with everything that happened, you know, what, what ended up happening was that students were trying to go and complete their GCSEs and they have to fight the press and journalists by getting into their school and imagine trying to receive an education in that system and then what that means for their futures and also a big part of sorry what i also didn't mention at the top of um this discussion is that uh, the trojan horse letter was fake it, yes it, there wasn't anything real about these allegations and actually what the head of the school had done was completely turn in this instance Park, Parkview School completely around and succeeded all their Ofsted investigations and made it so that there was like a huge like astronomical increase of GCSE pass rates for the students. It was an outstanding school as yeah. as um, you know that was judged by the Ofsted recently uh, previously mm. so you know wh where like how can you take that credit away from that school and from those individuals like Tahir Alam who's you know the 
the the man at the sort of forefront of this witch hunt that happened um and i've met tahir alam and you know he talks about how his you know people who were previously his friends um when they like if if they see him if they sort of like see him walking towards uh, them people are literally turning around and ignoring that like you know they will turn away from him because they're so scared to be seen with him that's the sort of stigma that was created around him and you know he was just he was a he was a common boy from birmingham who had a you know who who had a struggling childhood but he made a great thing out of you know he he created a great thing out of it and and then not to be then discredited for all the hard work that he'd done it's just and especially know. like how the investigations really twisted everything, everything that they were investigating to go from one minute um, praising the school for meeting the needs of the students in terms of having a call to prayer every day and then instantly that's then seen as oh inciting radicalization mm-hmm. um, I mean I, I went switches. to a church of England, England primary school back in the 90s and we started our day with hymns mm-hmm. and I loved it I'm a muslim uh but i loved it because it was so much fun you know st- sitting in the um in the uh, hall and singing hymns for me it was a sing song right uh but that is an act of worship isn't it right mm-hmm. correct me if i'm mm-hmm. wrong oh. and yeah and and you know and that that was fine so um like i found it quite um calming in the morning and that is what like what what our character farah says is you know the call to prayer uh was a peaceful moment for her in the day and then so how can that be how you know for for children like we're, we're always talking about mindfulness nowadays you know this whole thing if it's packaged in whiteness yes. then it's, it's yeah. acceptable but when it's something religious or yeah. faith then that's we'll... the thing that this play reveals all the way through is like the number of double standards yes. applied yeah. by like the media and the government is like when it comes to religion in schools it's oh when it's like the church of england that's all healthy and good but when it's islam it must be like something sinister mm. uh when homophobia is like uh tory mp's voting mm. against gay mm. marriage mm. then that's like protecting kids but when it's like a Muslim teacher who might hold secret homophobic views, that's mm. suddenly mm. like, oh my God, mm. like we I must demonise that. When it's sexism from coming from like white men, it's like, oh, they're just old fashioned. When it's any sexism happening within a non-white community, it becomes like, oh, that's a community problem. It's a radical thing. Yeah. absolutely just... I mean, um, uh, uh, Professor John Holmwood says this quite a lot during the panel discussions, and um, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase what he says, but... He talks about how you know when we talk about religious tolerance right we talk about you know sort of muslims being tolerant towards christians christians being tolerant towards jews you know so sort of like inter religion but we never talk about secular people being tolerant towards religious people and it's a, it's almost as though you know like a secular person um can own their identity and live out their identity right so um they they are free to be secular in the same way if we live in a democratic free world then a muslim person or a christian person or a jew person should be able to live out their identity to the fullest they should not have to pretend to be like secular for example do you know so tolerance is nowadays i think is a, it's not even sort of between religions i think it's more about the non religious being tolerant of the religious and um like islam from my from my i mean i i'm muslim i i can't claim to be an authority on islam but from what i've been taught from my parents since i was a child was that islam is a very peaceful and tolerant religion and we are not allowed to hurt or harm anybody by intention we're not so you know this whole idea of islam being a terrorist or a violent based religion it's ridiculous look extremism exists everywhere right uh a terrorist may be muslim but a terrorist may not be muslim uh there's good people in 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 the west there's bad people in the west there's good people in in the east there's bad people in the east right it's just to marginalize a you know a demographic um of people i think it's just really really dangerous to society i mean did you hear about that young child i may be getting some of the details wrong but um when asked at school uh, what kind of a house you live in he said i live in a terrorist house and then he and because of uh, sort of all the prevent training that teachers are getting now 
you know, the whole, like there was this huge inquiry and, you know, the whole parents were involved and, you know, that they, they, they were, they came under surveillance. The child was saying he was, he lived in a terrorist house yeah, yeah. and, you know, just because that boy was a brown Muslim boy, it became they a whole thing. Terrorist, terrorist instead of yeah. terrorist joined to the house next door yeah, to Yeah, it's just ridiculous. And yeah. this kind of stuff There's is happening so many all the like time. That, yeah. yeah. Well, also with the, um, Shamima, uh, Shamima, 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 yeah, Begum. Bibi, yeah. Um, you know, a couple years ago, in terms of the way the press spin the idea of innocence of young girls and and then having no empathy for her position. I think that was really sad. She was a British, like, underage girl, right? And we um, isolated her. As a, as a community, we sort of washed our hands off her. And at the end, it, you know, I... If she was not a brown Muslim girl... I think everybody, all of these, you know, human rights activists, all, all the UNs of the world, they would, ha- they would have, they would have brought her home. People were too scared, and that is the kind of trickle down effect of the Trojan horse case, yeah. you know, and obviously the rise of racism and yeah. Islamophobia. But this is, you know, it's continuing to ripple, um, and isn't leaving. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I mean, like, what the sad thing is, um, women are left out of these conversations a lot. Trust me. Uh, within, you know, whether it's across the board, I feel like no one asks women's perspectives on it. Um, and I find that really, really difficult to digest. And I like the fact that The Trojan Horse, I mean, it was written by Matt Woodhead and Helen um, Monks, who are obviously, the, you know, we've got representation there. But um, there's there's equal representation in the team at Lung Theatre, um, and it's really nice. I mean, I'm here and I'm a South Asian woman um, on a national tour with a theater, with a national, nationally acclaimed theater company. And I've, I'm really, really proud to be sort of in this position. I can't claim to know everything about everything about this project. But, you know, just the fact that I've been given a voice through it, um, it's really, I think there's hope there. Um, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask about the um, kind of the responses you might have had from different cities, different communities, um, and you mentioned to us just before we start recording that so- sometimes people question the authenticity of the show, yes. even though we know it says in the copy it's made from interviews. Yes. Um, and how um, Helen and Matt kind of navigate that, and how yeah. Yeah. That's a- um, so uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Matt and Helen interviewed eighty nine people, so almost ninety people from the community, uh, so that, you know, there were counsellors, teachers, students, parents, um, people who were who were directly or indirectly involved, and anyone who yeah. agreed to be interviewed. And it seems like, you know, when, it, when there's that many people who are willing to talk about this, yeah. it shows how much they weren't given a platform to talk yeah. about this. Yeah, yeah, but there were a lot of people that were invited that never responded, uh, like Mr. Gove didn't respond. They, yeah. He was approached for an interview, he just didn't, you know, he didn't respond. Anyway, um, and they collected over 200 hours of recordings, uh, which then they adapted into this one hour, 20 minute play. Um, It is a piece of verbatim theatre, which means that everything that you hear in the play has been said by somebody. Now, um, how do you how do you sort of test the authenticity of that, you know, what, how do we know that it's the truth? How do you know that Matt and Helen are telling so the truth? He said, she said. Yeah, 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 yeah. right? So uh, what's happened is that the whole script has been tri- triangulated. So everything that was said was uh, triangulated, which just means that it's been tested uh, three by three sources. Um, so everything has been not dub- not one time double, it's been uh, triple checked um, to make sure that it's all authentic. Um, and, you know, I, I trust, and I mean, to be honest, if there was any uh, misconstruing of the truth, I think by now somebody would have come and come and said it and the whole play is is being supported by um by you know the teachers and governors who were originally accused uh, we've had a few of them on our panel so we've had Tahir Alam we've had Inam Malik uh, we've had um uh, Rizwan Faraz so um these two uh, Rizwan was uh, the deputy head of Parkview Academy Tahir Alam was the chief uh, the head of governors at the um at the academy and so you know they're supporting it so um, and also, like, one of the original reviews um, uh, from, you know, when the show was at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival was that the, the I think someone said something about, you know, the, the, the worst thing about this play is that it is too balanced. 
So I think that's a testament to how authentic it is. So they've not, Matt and Helen, um, although they do have an opinion about the case, right? They've tried not to be biased in the in the uh, sort of the the representation of all the of what they found out. They've just sh- they're just showing what they found. That's it. So you know they're putting on the table. This is what we found, and then it's up to you to make the decision. Um, it you know you you conclude yourself through your own thinking. So it's not it's not it's definitely not sort of you know. Um, trying to drive the audience one way or the other it's just the showing of the truth which should have been done by the media at the time rather than the media creating this who you know this like over dramatized version or you know this like tabloidy mm-hmm. version of the truth I yeah i say it reflects really badly on the bbc considering Absolutely. that we're meant to have like a publicly accountable media in this country via that like okay the tabloids are going to mm. say what they're going to say but like it's mm. just mm, it's atrocious it's atrocious yeah. but look right um the uh, like i said there is there is tr- there's a, there's hope there because um the common man has a voice and the common man has power and if many of us common people get together we can create a movement this is how all the movements if you look throughout history that's all how this is how movements happen and you know from small to big revolutions take place because one man started you know like uh, question the status quo right so art for me for me right as an artist um, as somebody who practices within the sector i think art needs to question status quo right i mean yeah it's a place for entertainment it should look good and you know it's fun whatever but it should be questioning the status quo and it really really does it sometimes i mean i've had audience members who have nothing to say after the play because they're just so engrossed in digesting what they've just seen you know um because it it's really challenging their beliefs it's really really uh, it's it's made them question their own sort of inner self and that is what that's what art should do right and um i'm quite i'm pleased to say that i think trojan horse is successful in that and you know you talk about the the communities receiving it um yes we've had a very diverse um diverse uh, audience ship to the play so far um so Bradford was quite a vibrant um audience I think. Uh but as you know Bradford is it's I think it's the th- third largest uh British pa- British Pakistani demographic in the whole of UK and it's also one of the youngest cities in the, in Europe, right? Um so I don't think we hit engagement as much as I had wanted to, but still we had sell out shows, right? Um and I think the panel discussions in Bradford were very comprehensive. Um so these were people who were directly affected uh by um the Trojan Horse inquiries and consequently by the prevent uh, reforms and the prevent agenda that came out of it that came directly out of the inquiries. And they, you know they they question they they are they they furious. They're furious. They they're frustrated. They feel helpless. Uh, they feel like what has happened um, in in society, um, for example, when it comes to the narrative making of the British Muslim community, they feel like they've got no control over it. And you know, they're just these are normal people who are just like, dude, we're just trying to do, we're just trying to get on with our lives, right? Um, so that that was a really really great um, great sort of discussion that we had in Bradford and then um from the off the top of my head recently in Battersea uh we had a um a gentleman who is a you know he's a global head of global operations for a global pharmaceutical company really really high achieving but he's a british muslim from warsaw which is a couple of it's only a couple of miles away from birmingham so you know pretty much close to the community and this grown man was in tears during the panel because he talks about he talked about how his 11 year old daughter his 11 year old british muslim pakistani background daughter wants to cure cancer right but she's still seen under the sort of the microscope of this you know falsely created nar- like narrative and the prevent agenda and he's just like my kid like how do i explain to my children that 
they're going to be treated differently. How do, he said, you know, on a trip to America, um, his wife and two daughters were let through um, security, but his his uh, himself and his six year old boy were randomly selected for a for a um, check, and he was like, my six year old son, like, that's really scary for a six year old child. He's like, how do I tell my six year old child who was born and bred in Britain that it's okay, it's fine, they're, they're gonna, it's going to be... It's just, you know, this kind of, like, ridiculous injustices. Um, and it, that's just one story out of millions, you know. Um, and it's, I think it's really, really great for people from, you know, the non-South Asian community or the non-Muslim community in Britain to hear these stories because um, it creates relatability. And, yeah, I think, I think Lung Theatre are a very... They're very activist-driven, but... I'm just going to say, you know, they're just incredibly, incredibly nice people. And it is, it's so easy to work with them. And it is so easy to be an audience member at a play that Lung have produced. Because, you know, the sort of environment that we create and, you know, the, the, the way Helen and Matt are always there to welcome the audiences and to take any questions. Um, it just, it, it helps. Um, yeah, all praises seriously for the team uh, but but you know um we've also we're, we've also talked about actually producing the play in urdu because the script has been translated and um because i think it's still quite difficult for the south asian community who may not you know interact much with with people outside the community to come to a theater where they've never been before to you know to come and sit next to people that are not from their community or from their family um to watch a play in urdu and then have to wear headsets to listen to it in, 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 in so sorry watch the play in english but listen to it via headsets there's quite a lot of stigma and you know i think people feel embarrassed or it's just really, really difficult. Like, we've had people come to the theatre to watch Trojan Horse as a direct um, consequence of our engagement drive um, who've never been to the theatre. So the first time they've ever stepped foot into the theatre has been to come and watch Trojan Horse. And I think it's a brave move, guys. Like, I don't know about you, but if I've not done something and it's, I'm doing it for the first time, it's really, really scary. Um, and, you know, um, you just there's just so much uncertainty and you don't... And then, like, there's, you know, there is a big fear within the South Asian community, especially the South Asian Muslim community. I'm saying because I, I know because I'm from that community. Um, there's... I think a lot, of, a lot of people from the South Asian Muslim community feel like they're not liked by other people because of the narratives that have been created and it's it's almost like they just want to keep themselves to themselves and just get on with things it's like they don't want to you know they don't want to cause trouble and that's really really sad because these are members of members like these are contributing uh, members of our society and um, yeah but I think I think it's a really great idea if we put the play on in Urdu um, I'm definitely going to push for that because um, you know I'm one of the founding members of Yorkshire at the B Forum um, it's a global network of Urdu writers um, based out of West Yorkshire and um, they acted as the cultural um, cultural advisors for Trojan Horse and they've helped us a lot so our, my team has helped me a lot with the engagement stuff um, across the UK I think we should work together on creating a Urdu language play um, I think that'd be really really exciting yeah, yeah. we saw in the script that uh, where it has the introduction of Saida Farsi and she says yes. at the end of the forward she says this is a start yes and it does feel like this is the start of something yes like this is not the the, the no. final yeah. no. the only thing we can do no. it's one thing in a chain of yeah, yeah. many different yeah. um productions that could happen Absolutely. in different languages yeah. on different mediums yeah. i think it could go far and you know what you know people who complain about this being a play about south asian muslim stories written by two white men uh, sorry two white people um, matt and helen i would say well if you're a south asian person and you have a story to tell do it write it get in touch with us we'll help you produce it write it mm -hmm. who's stopping you Who's stopping you writing those stories? Um, so, you know, there's no, like, you. if you want to be represented, if you want to see a change in the world, oh my God, I'm going to, like, get ready for this cliched quote, but if you want to see a change in the world, be the change in the world, you have to do it. So, you know, there's no point sitting in your, in, in the comfort of your sitting rooms complaining about there's been a play written by white people. 
you should like come out tell your stories like join hands with us you know it's so great that this is this is a message or you know that the, the project is not just being endorsed by muslim british muslim people there is such a diversity i mean just look at us sat you know the three mm. of us sat in this room um i don't think any th- we don't share any backgrounds or anything <laughs> except for the fact that you know we just love theater and mm. we, we want to tell the truth yeah, yeah. yes I think that's a good feminist fave. Move yeah. on to uh, some, on that positive note. Yeah. Some uh, recommendations of things that you would love to shout out for our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, I work, I live in West Yorkshire. I'm from a small town in Dewsbury. And um, I, li- I work in Bradford. Bradford's quite close to my heart. And there is a non-profit organisation called the Muslim Women's Council. Um, and it was founded by Barna Gora, who I believe was voted one of Vogue's um, most influential, she was on the some most influential women in the UK list, and rightly so. Uh, so the Muslim Women's Council is working to build the first ever women-led mosque in the UK, um, and that's very, very exciting. I think the sort of objective of the Muslim Women's Council is to take back control of the Muslim woman narrative, right? Um, they have just they're piloting a think tank program at the moment, which I'm a part of. Really, really privileged to be a part of. Where they they're bringing together women um, from all walks of life, uh, mostly in the West Yorkshire region, and they're trying to um, they're training and doing a series of workshops to uh, to train up these women to become um, sort of a think tank group for policy making. So policy making um, of uh, um, issues that directly affect Muslim women um, because so far we have men advocating for us, right? And that's really, it's just, I mean, I don't, I've got nothing against men. Like, I love men. I'm the mum of two boys. Mm-hmm. Um, very proud to be. Uh, but the thing is, you know, if you if you want to make a change or if you want to create a policy around something that affects Muslim women, ask Muslim women what they think, you know? And so far, nobody has done so. <laughs> so definitely, the Muslim Women's Council, they're such amazing, so powerful uh, women. Um, so yeah, definitely that. And I think in terms of art, oh my God, there's so much. There are so many women-led um, films and shows and music and art at the moment. Um, but I would... Oh, I would love to mention that my favourite actor at the moment is Kate, not at the moment, in life, mm-hmm. is Kate Blanchett. Have I said that right? How would you say yeah, it, Lenny? Yeah. yeah, Kate Blanchett. She's such a powerhouse of a woman and the roles that she plays, such diverse roles. And, you know, she's also a mum of something like 20 children, I'm joking. <laughs> Isn't it six or five or oh six? Oh, my God, she? Yeah. And, you know, and she's, she's amazing, she's beautiful, but she's, I love the fact that you can't pin her down um, I just I like that fact about her. There's you know there's something really there's something really sexy and something really um, attractive about a woman who's not scared to um, you know she you can't put her in a box. So as an aspiring actress, um, I I really do look up to her. And of course, there's people like Meryl Streep, but I'm sure everybody says Meryl <laughs> Streep, so I don't want to get that. For our listeners, Medea is wearing a Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> Do you know why I'm wearing this, right? It's because when I went to get my hair cut, I've always had really, really long hair. And recent, uh, about two years ago, I went super, super short, so shorter than what I have at the moment. This is the picture that I showed my um, my hairdress. I was like, I, I want my that. hair like this. Yes. But I can never get it to rise because my hair is quite thick and mm-hmm. every time I blow it dry it up, it goes... Yeah. yeah. But um, but then I found this shirt and I was like, I must have it. I must <laughs> have it. So, so yeah. Um, and in terms of... So I'm a big I'm a big endorser and very, very passionate about South Asian arts practices. Um, so I was born in Karachi. And um, contrary to um, sort of the, the, the common belief, um, there is a huge art scene in Pakistan and India... Uh, but Pakistan has a huge art scene and there is a huge feminist, um, f- feminism-driven progressive writers movement um, happening in Pakistan. There is, there is a lady called uh, Dr. Bushra Malik, who um, she's from Germany, she lives in Bonn, and she leads a, um, a group of feminist Muslim writers. Um, and, you know, I'm really proud to sort of be part of that network. And then there's a lot of, um, I mean, we, we are going through a big reform uh, within the Pakistani cinema scene. 
And uh, recently there was a film um, that came out called Cake. Um, and I think Cake would pass all the Beckdale tests mm-hmm. because um, it is essentially the story of two sisters. Um, and they, you know, the, 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 there is no, I mean, it's, a, it's the story of a family, but I think the main characters, you know, the, the, the sort of story revolves around the evolution of these two sisters' lives, their relationships, not uh, so with each other, but their relationships with their father, their mother. Uh, and then there's men in the, like, you know, there's, there's romantic um, leads. In, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them romantic leads, but, you know, there's men. Come on. They exist. Yeah, yeah. Exist. You know, like I'm, I'm, you know, there's nothing wrong with having those relationship. But yeah, the film is called Cake, and um, it like I would, it is available on Netflix. Um, so yeah, Pakistani okay. movie Cake. It was, it came out in 2014, and um, yeah, just um, it's different to the Jennifer Aniston Cake. Uh, <laughs> so, so, not that one. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, no, actually, let me to so see. The Jennifer Aniston cake came out in 2014. The Pakistani cake came out in 2018. And um, funnily, it was directed by a man called Asim Abbasi. And um, it's just, it's really, really great. And um, I think one of the main things that I really, really liked about this movie was there's a great mix of cosmopolitan uh, city. Uh, so it, it's based in Karachi, but then you go into rural Sindh, which is, you know, a completely different area of Pakistan that you rarely see represented in sort of international cinema um and um yeah and the music's been done by uh, a friend of mine <laughs> called oh, wow. uh, it's a band called the sketches who are really big on the south asian folk music scene but yeah Ooh. i'll just start talking yeah. about it yeah so the muslim women's council whoop whoop uh kate blanchett yes she's my hero heroine whatever you want to say it um and cake the pakistani film those are my feminist faves at the moment. Amazing. That is a great selection. Yes. And you guys. Oh. <laughs> Definitely. You don't quite compare to any of those. No, no. Why not? Like, you know, if you want to see the change, girls. It's true. We it's try. Really true. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> well, we, we try and do the change. You had a feminist fave that you met, that you left off last month. I know. I had one from, from last month that I forgot to mention because mine last month were... Um, my feminist phase were kind of talking about like um, butch lesbian representation. Yes. And I forgot to mention the most recent love of mine, if you know me at all, you know how much I bang on about this book, um, called Stone Butch Blues, which is written by um, a person called Leslie Feinberg and uh, published in the 90s, but it charts um, the lead character, Jess, who is a described as a stone butch lesbian, but it, um, in kind of 40s, 50s, all the way up to 60s, 70s, um, New York um, and charts she uses different pronouns throughout the book but it's kind of it's kind of sticks with she in a way um, exploration of her gender identity and also about um, just the, the, the main thing that struck me from the book was the uh, level of police brutality that queer people faced in kind of 50s uh, America and also very specifically of like the white working class and how butch lesbians did a lot of kind of um, like factory work um, and was really kind of on the ground in those <laughs> industries because they couldn't get jobs anywhere else. But also the level of abuse and harassment that they received in those places when they're just trying to work like anyone else. And the kind of cross community, like abuse that happened, but also the it seemed in this book about how much kind of, how united the LGBTQ plus community were because everyone was being, uh, everyone had police brutality against them and there wasn't this, so much separation between people who had different sexual identities and people who had different gender identities um, and kind of sharing spaces in kind of gay bars and, and lesbian spaces and things like that. So it's a beautiful, beautiful book. It's out of print. It's really expensive if you want to buy your original copy because um, they, they don't make them anymore. Mm. But you can get it from Leslie's. Unfortunately, Leslie, Leslie passed away. Um, a few years ago, but um, you can get it from their website as a PDF, so it's available for anyone to read, and that's how I read it. Um, and it, I cannot tell you the number of times I cried reading it. It was it's so beautifully written, and just kind of gave voice to all these lost voices that I'd never heard before. Um, and yeah, just like was a, a beautiful way to kind of learn yeah. my history, queer history. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like queer rights are human rights mm. and it's just 
I think we can say it, we can bang on about it, but some people are just never going to hear us. And, you know, it's just, it's a shame. Mm, I love that they're in Trojan Horse as well, though. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just single it's, issues. Yeah, no, yeah exactly. No. Well, um, you know, to be honest with you, um, I'm going to confess, I was a bit apprehensive. Um, so, you know, I, like... This is not my opinion, but because I have to, as the engagement officer and uh, engagement manager, and like, because I know my community, we had quite a few conversations um, <clears throat> we had, uh, with Matt, and I talked to him about, you know, if you want to engage the community, have you ever have you thought about sort of taking the, um, you know, some of, some of the, but I don't want to I don't want to spoil it, but you know, I said to him, can you take some of this out, some of that out, and I felt really, really guilty saying that because. It's not because I want it taken out, but I know how my community is going to take it. And I don't want to discredit, I don't want the play to be discredited just because someone's sensibility has been hurt and they're offended by one little aspect of it. Um, and then I don't want them to go with, you know, sort of discrediting the whole play. And um, so we, you know, we, we came to a, a bit of a compromise um, on, on that, on that. But um, it's really sad because, like, sometimes to... You know, even myself, who I see myself as quite uh, free and, you know, I support freedom of speech and all of that. But sometimes I feel like I have to pander to the needs of my community just to engage them or just to sort of, you know, keep them hooked. Um, even if it goes against my my own beliefs, which is really sad. But, you know, yeah. Oh, it just made me think watching it, though, about, like, if you were, like... A young queer Muslim woman, and you'd been, you know, brought on a school trip or something to see it. I would be like, oh, yeah, to see oh, that story. Like okay, that. didn't expect to see that there. You know, it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who's your feminist fave? My feminist fave. I wanted to talk about it. back to the BBC again after having uh, sagged off the BBC a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Love you. I'm gonna do it smart. <laughs> no, my feminist fave is um, Samira Ahmed for taking to court the BBC during the BBC (laughs) she had an 85% pay discrepancy between her and a male presenter presenting equivalent TV shows and following that trial has been so eye opening the number of basically their defence for paying him more than her was that he is more entertaining than she is was that what it that she, he has a cheeky glint in his eye and sometimes puts on a funny hat and she was like I'm funny she's really I she's, think so, funny. Funny. Yeah. she's so like warm and yeah. personal and friendly yeah. oh like God. when you see her presenting she's got she's entertaining right yeah. you can't claim that he's entertaining and she's not a like a the layers of like prejudice in claiming yeah. that this white guy can no. do it all and his 85% m- higher salary is worth it is just ludicrous. Yeah. And I oh really like the God. results of the tribunal haven't come out yet, but I really support her in that. Um, and also she has her own podcast called How I Found My Voice, which is wow. about, it's, it's uh, lots of different people like creatives, but also kind of, clever people thinkers who are outspoken and yeah. she asks them about how they did found their voice whether it was through like writing as a young person or like when they first stepped on a stage for the first time mm. or like took up a political campaign mm. for the first time and it's really interesting to hear about people because you always see people in the mm. media that are so well spoken and so like forthright mm. and you think god how did you learn to express yourself so mm. clearly and mm. like I, yeah, I completely get that because um, I think I use my poetry to say things that I wouldn't otherwise say. And um, I like, I, I, like theatre is such a great way uh, because when you're a character, it's fine. You can say, do what, you know, because mm. it's like, it's not me saying it, it's the character saying it. And I really, really like that. I like, like, because as a poet, I'm not Madiha, you know, the mum or the daughter. I'm Madiha, the poet. And I really like that. But, you know, we were talking about pay. So the Cultural Ecology Project, like I said, you know, we're we're supporting South Asian female arts practitioners. Uh, But one of our mission statements is to economize the sector. Um, So as a rule of thumb, um, I never ask anyone. So whether it's someone who's got zero experience or whether it's someone who's got 20 years of experience, I will never ask anyone to provide a service for me for free. So, and I expect that, like, that's, that's a precedent that I want to set for South Asian female um, women in the arts uh, because 
previously it didn't exist. It was like, you know, it, it, it's as though the market, it's as though we're not professionals in the market. And, and I don't like, I don't like that. I mean, I'm, I'm really, really proud to let you know that um, as part of the Cultural Ecology Project, I have trained up, not I, we as a team, have trained up uh, two um, under 25 South Asian Muslim girls who um, I was away on a conference during the tour and they did my job. So uh, Jannat and Neda, Jannat um, has an interest in um, tech. She wants to be a theatre tech person, which is amazing. She's she's amazing. She's a um, professional photographer as well, only 22. And then Nidha is 24, and she wants. She's really interested in engagement work within the arts, and and we were able to do that. And I could not have done that without the support of the team at Lung, and you know Matt and Helen and Camille, our um, our uh, touring stage manager, who you know they they've created. So we've created mentorship pathways and these girls are ready for the next national tour like they're they're professionals that i don't call them trainees i call them associates and i want to grow that network and you know and so that so that when when like the next generation of women in the arts whether you know whether they're colored or not colored or whether they're you know whatever the sexuality whatever right just i just want them to be known as just artists so i like i like being a woman of color in the arts but can i just be called like no. a person in yeah. the arts. Do you know why? Why does it have to be? Yeah, we we joke or a running joke of ours is that we just hope that we don't have to do this job one day because representation <laughs> yeah. will have improved. And, it's you like know. diversity. Do you know? I get called to talk about diversity a lot, and I do it with great pride, and it's a privilege to you know sit in front of people and talk about it. But I think the the only day the the, the day that we can stop talking about diversity yeah, is the day that we will have achieved it. Mm. So you know. Yes. But yeah, you guys are doing a fantastic job and you know, it's really really like it's it's lovely to be in the company of people who are who think like mindedly and you know, you're young and you're making moves. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. And that's yeah. why we do the podcast, so we get to talk to more people yeah. who are making change and we can all be inspired by each yeah. other. So thank yeah, it's you. a real privilege to Thank you so much guys. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, for those people that don't know, the uh, Trojan Horse, the first national tour, um, we are at the Battersea Arts Centre in South London till the 16th of November. So you can get your tickets through the Batsy Arts Centre website. And then we're in Birmingham. Um, Birmingham is pretty much sold out, but I think we've got some, we've got a matinee show um, in Birmingham. So look that up. We're at the Midland Arts Centre. Um, we've got some tickets available there. But if you are a community group, specifically a South Asian community group, you can get in touch with us. Um, you can get in touch with me at Madiha at uh, lungtheatre.co.uk and um, if you've got a community group that wants to come and watch it we'll hook you up with tickets so you know get in touch but if you've missed it this time around don't worry because the next national tour for Trojan Horse by Lung Theatre is coming back in February Yay! <laughs> we will be plugging the hell out of it yes. Woo, thank you yes. so much thank, thank you. you girls yeah. thank you Medea. we have for you a series of show recommendations for the month of December. We have been to the Bunker Theatre twice in the last couple of weeks and it has been a joy. So the first few recommendations are from the Bunker Theatre. Get there before it closes next year. The first show, And So the Choir Gathers, which is only on the 17th and 18th of November, so not long to catch that. This is a new live performance by Liv Winter. It explores the importance of subculture as a tool for radical organising, and it is the punkest punk show that we have ever seen in a theatre space. This is not actors, musicians pretending to be punks. This is real activists tearing the place up, and it is amazing. So you've got two more chances to see that before it closes. That's Live Winters and So the Choir Gathers. Also at the bunker, we have I Will Still Be Whole and Before I Was a Bear. And they are phenomenal. I Will Still Be Whole has had a reboot. It is very different to when we saw it at the vaults. It was amazing then and it's amazing now. It's got incredible acting in it. They just were phenomenal. And Arva Wong Davis writing, just you'll... You'll be glad you were there. You'll be able to tell people in the future. I was there 
when I saw Arva's first play because she is such a writer, as you'll know if you've read any of her reviews and listened to her on our previous episode. That's in a double bill with a show called Before I Was a Bear, which is Ellen Tyndall. She's written a play which is inspired by a Greek myth, but you can kind of get most of the way through the play without even knowing that it's based on a Greek myth in any way. It's so relatable. Following on from those shows at the bunker, Yes, I told you we like shows at the bunker. The next show they have coming up is Little Miss Burden, uh, which is a wonderful friend of ours, Matilda Beanie's coming of age tale. She's smashing together 90s nostalgia, Nigerian families, East London, and Sailor Moon to tell the tricky but often funny truth about growing up with a physical impairment. So the story is, at 13, Little Miss is given a gift that cannot be returned. She has to share her body and her life with it and needs to find a way for the two of them to get along as they can't both be player one. So it's about Little Miss and her two sisters, Big Sis and Little Sis. And they're kind of, they're a girl band in the manner of Cleopatra. They are super fierce, cool, talented. I'm so looking forward to this show. Uh, That is on at the bunker from the 4th till the 21st of December. And then moving away from the bunker, uh, but still with Matilda. There's a show called Midnight Movie, which is opening at the Royal Court on November 27th until December 21st. It's written by Eve Lee, who is an absolute fave playwright of mine, uh, directed by Rachel Bagshaw, whose show The Shape of Pain was really incredible a few years ago, and dramaturgy by Matilda of uh, Little Miss Burden fame. And... Midnight Movie is about being disabled on the internet and the freedom that gives those who feel restricted in the actual world, IRL. And it's also about the fact that everyone's physical body lets us down eventually. And it's about the difficulties of physical bodies letting you down. And it's something that everyone involved in creating the play has experienced. They also explore what that means when they are making art. And so as a result, the play itself is a moment, a series of moments on the internet when someone's having a sleepless night and the production itself is relaxed in every performance. It creatively combines both spoken English and British Sign Language and captioning and audio description and live drumming. So it aims to include all the different types of communication possible to make it accessible for as many people as possible. And it also has this amazing thing called a digital body, which is designed for anyone who has a physical body that can't make it to the show to be, they still want everybody to be part of this performance. So you sign up online and then you receive a series of digital letters, which are like a combination of a scary story or an essay or like audio visual content. And they're all inspired by the content of the play and created by the team behind the show and they're designed to be part of the experience of the show um so they send out the first digital letter during the run and that is there not just like it's not just an extra for anyone who does get to the royal court to see the show but it's designed particularly for anyone who cannot get to the royal court to see the show which is just a wonderful concept i love it soho theater has some great stuff coming up, some real fun stuff coming up uh, as we get into uh, Christmas and going out on nights out. Uh, Lucy McCormick is a really, really fun one. Post popular. This is basically, when we saw it in Edinburgh Fringe, I thought it was a parody of basic white feminist takes on women's history. So Lucy uses her like persona that she has which is a combination of a pop star and a sort of live art wanker and then she explodes them both into the audience and messes with our expectations of both going to like a fun camp cabaret show and our expectations of going to see a serious political art piece and she uses this trope of like the diva and then the backing dancers. And for, for me, the real highlight of this show is the absolute genius performances that are from Reese Hollis and Samir Kennedy, which just take, ramp up that irony that Lucy creates of trying to do all the women in history in an hour. And they just ramp up that irony to absolutely superb, supreme levels and completely subvert the idea of like, 
trying to cover her story. Post Popular is on at Soho Theatre from December 3rd till 14th. If you enjoy Lucy McCormick, or you think that sounds good, uh, there is also Psycho Siren Leah Shenton is coming to Soho Theatre with an absurdist lip sync meets high camp bitch on heat. Uh, Nothing is sacred as Leah crawls through a Pandora's box of ancient myths and porn and pop culture. And that is on from the 5th to the 14th of December. So you could probably maybe double bill them. They sound like they would complement each other. I haven't seen Leah's show, but Lucy's show is great. Go and see both of them. Our fave Sophie Duca has a show on Soho Theatre. We were going to recommend that, but it's sold out. But guess what? It was so popular, it's extended till January. So buy someone you love a ticket to see Sophie Duca's show, Venus, which is on from the 13th to the 18th of January. That will be the perfect ticket for the stand-up comedy lovers in your life. Performance artist Louise Orwin is back with her show, Oh Yes, Oh No, which is a heady mix of pop culture references for anyone who's struggled to find their sexual voice or question sexual culture that they were brought up in. And this includes having sexual fantasies that don't align with your politics. So Louise uses Barbie and Ken, um, interviews conducted all over the UK, and she's understanding what it means to reclaim desire in the face of sexual trauma and rape culture. Uh, it's provocative, it's dark, it's surreal, and it is very, very frank and honest. One of these shows that's in the wake of hashtag me too, but feels like, really, it's for any time. This is currently on tour, and it's got a two-week run at Battersea Arts Centre, which finishes on November 23rd, and then it is going to Chichester, Chichester Showroom, on Thursday, November 28th. Easy at the Blue Elephant Theatre is a show about what happens when we combine social media, Love Island ideals, Snapchat and teenage insecurity. It's an intimate portrait of adolescence today and asks, why is it so hard to believe we're good enough as we are? Easy is special because it is developed in consultation with teachers and teenagers and it includes free PSHE workshops available to all school and youth group bookings when the workshops are supported by the sexual health charity brook so if you are a teacher or know anyone a teacher who is a teacher or who works with young people doing things that are related to phe then that would be a really good one to see that's easy at blue elephant theater and it is on until november 23rd thursdays till saturdays the next recommendation is a little bit of an unusual one for us it is uh, the National Theatre's production of Three Sisters. Mm. They don't usually have shows on that we recommend, and we're not usually prone to recommending uh, big, long Chekhov plays either. But this production of Three Sisters is adapted. It's a co-production with Fuel, and it's adapted by Inwa Ellens. So it's an interesting take on Three Sisters that is transported the action to 1960s Nigeria on the brink of civil war, months before two military coups plunge the country into chaos and the conflict encroaches on this provincial village where the sisters long to return to their former home in Lagos, which of course in the Chekhov original it was like, oh I want to go to Moscow and this is like, oh I want to go to Lagos. So this is Inwa Ellams who is famous for the Barbershop Chronicles. He is being, his adaptation is being directed by Nadia Fall and it is starring Rachel Afori as one of the three sisters who we have loved her solo work in the past. So actually really looking forward to this. And the final recommendation we have for you is a seasonal festive treat. This is a twist on the pantomime tradition in this country. In the vaults, where our previous episode was situated, where the Red Palace is still continuing on, there's another production happening in within the same network of tunnels, which is Aladdin and the Feast of Wonders. So it's not your traditional pantomime Aladdin, but it is inspired by Aladdin and by Arabian Nights. And it is given a full drag makeover. It's written, directed, and choreographed by drag star Shay Shay. It has a predominantly Asian cast. It serves a full meal. Yeah, given like mama's 
nudes like a noodle dish um i've heard really amazing things about both the food and the show and the policy of strictly no cultural appropriation. So the audience are encouraged to dress up, to come to the feast, the banquet, but there is a strict ban on anybody who is not from the right cultural background to be wearing things like turbans and bindis. And they have a strict door policy where if anyone misinterprets the dress code and turns up wearing a bunch of cultural appropriation gear, they will be asked to remove it before they go into the venue. I think this will be an excellent antidote to a lot of the productions of Aladdin that are happening around the country and a lot of just general cultural appropriation, whitewashing bullshit that is happening a lot at this time of year. So wishing you all a uh, merry festive season. We will be back just before Christmas with another episode, but hope you will stay warm and see some wonderful theatre. Bye. (laughs)